this is part number seven of our Bible summary. Finished last time Paul's epistles, finished the book of Philemon. And so now we're doing a Bible summary starting in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews to Revelation is a section of the Bible that is written to Israel for their program. It is written for the end times. So when, when the church, the body of Christ is raptured up, that's the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Romans 11, 25 and 26 says that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. So the fullness of the Gentiles are come in when the rapture takes place of the church, the body of Christ, and then God resumes his program with Israel, and Israel is saved. We mentioned about Daniel's 70 weeks when we were in the book of Daniel. And 69 of the weeks finished with the Messiah being crucified, and that leaves one final week. Now, when the rapture takes place, the 70th week doesn't begin immediately. There are some things that have to take place first. Uh, the, when, the seven, when the Antichrist makes a seven-year covenant with the nation of Israel, that is the tribulation period. Uh, there are some, uh, he has to come, he has to destroy uh, the temple that is there right now and then build a new temple. And there are some wars that have to happen that Daniel 11 mentions. There's, uh, Daniel 11 mentions periods of years. So I believe there's at least 40, perhaps 120 years gap between the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation period, the seven years. A lot of people think the seven years is going to happen right away. Uh, when you look at the, the compassion of God, that He is long-suffering, not, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you look how He keeps delaying His wrath, the great love of God that He keeps delaying His wrath. It makes sense then that there would be uh, a longer period of time than what most people think after the rapture and before the start of the tribulation period. So personally, I think it's going to be 120 years. 40 is uh, a very good guess, I think. Um, but uh, I, my guess is 120. Either way, there's got to be a period of years for the events of Daniel 11 to take place before the tribulation period starts. All right, so the books of Hebrews through Revelation are there for, uh, for the doctrine, for for uh, Israel after the rapture of the church. The, the way they're set up is very similar to how uh, Paul's epistles. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, and now abideth uh, these three, faith, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, and the greatest of these is charity. And Romans gives you the doctrine of faith. 1 and 2 Corinthians gives the reproof of faith. Galatians gives the correction. Then Ephesians gives the doctrine of charity, Philippians gives the reproof of charity, and Colossians gives the correction. First and Second Thessalonians gives the doctrine of hope, and there is no reproof or correction needed for hope. And then First Timothy through Philemon is the instruction in righteousness. But when you get to Hebrews through Revelation, Hebrews gives the doctrine of faith for Israel, James gives the reproof of that, and then the correction is found in First and Second Peter. Then the the doctrine of love is given in First John, and the reproof uh, is in Second and Third John, and then the correction is found in Jude. And then you've got uh, Revelation is the doctrine of hope, and no reproof or correction needed for that. And they've got instruction in righteousness. Their instruction in righteousness would be Job through Ecclesiastes. That's where they've got wisdom, and um, the Psalms are there. And so that would be the uh, instruction in righteousness for Israel, Job through uh, Ecclesiastes. No, through Job through Song of Solomon. Job through Song of Solomon. Okay, so we're in Hebrews through Revelation. So Hebrews is um, the doctrine of faith. You learn a lot about the details of how the, the cross, Jesus, how he suffered and sacrificed once for all. You find out in Hebrews that he brought his blood into the Holy of Holies in heaven and offered it there and where God accepted it there in heaven. 
you learn about how the that he is an, a priest of the order of Melchizedek that the Melchizedekian priesthood is higher than the Levitical priesthood. The Levit Levitical priesthood pertains to the flesh. The uh, Melchizedekian priesthood pertains to the soul. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14 says that um, if the blood of bulls and goats sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your dead conscience from dead works to serve the living? So purge your conscience. Your conscience isn't dead. How much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So you got the contrast there in just those two verses, Hebrews 9, 13, and 14, where it talks about the blood of bulls and goats. It was a fleshly thing, the Levitical priesthood, but it did not cover for your sin, for your soul. Uh, Hebrews 10, 4 says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Uh, Jesus Christ had to come as fully man, fully God, but also fully man. And he had to uh, live that perfect life and then shed his blood as atonement for our sins, making the sin payment or the, the for our sin there, the death payment. And so you learn about that. Now, it is specifically Hebrews is written to Hebrews, so it's to Israel, it's not to us today. But because there are a lot of details there about the cross that you don't find in other parts of the Bible, I mean, it's a real good uh, book to read, a lot of good information for us to learn about that sacrifice that Jesus made. To learn, although we're not under the Levitical priesthood and never were, to learn how the Melchizedekian priesthood is better and how Jesus Christ's blood is accepted by God as the atonement for sin, whereas uh, Levitical priesthood, the blood of bulls and goats, uh, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, but could never take away sin. Uh, you read in Hebrews chapter 2, it talks about how the time is short for Israel. And you find out in Hebrews chapter 3 that uh, God promised rest to the believers, but they didn't get it under Moses because of their unbelief. But yet there were some that believed, Joshua and Caleb. And so they ended up going into the, the promised land uh, while the rest of their generation died off in the wilderness. Uh, you learn in Hebrews 6, you learn about the warning about how uh, for Israel, they can lose their salvation. It is impossible for them if they have been partakers of the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Ghost, if they shall fall away, it is impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And that's a reference to them taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the image of the beast. Hebrews 11, great faith chapter. And that really solidifies that salvation is by faith because it's one thing for Romans 3.28 to say your salvation is by faith without the deeds of the law. But, uh, you know, because we're under grace, we're not under the law, we're under grace. We were never given the Mosaic law. But yet, Israel, they were given the Mosaic law. They were under that law. And Hebrews 11 clearly demonstrates that even those under the law are saved by faith and not by any works of the law. So a great chapter there. Uh, Hebrews 13 talking about Israel coming out from among the apostate nation and being separate, coming out of the camp, outside of the nation of Israel, just like Jesus came outside and John the Baptist did as well. So a uh, great book to give you a lot of details, a lot of good information about the cross and what Jesus Christ's sacrifice means, how it's so much more better than the Levitical priesthood and the animal sacrifices. But you have to keep in mind that um, that is not to you. It's written to the Hebrews. It's for Israel's program. But it's a good, uh, good, a lot of good information there that you can learn uh, for your own edification. Then you got the book of James is after that. A lot of people use that to try to put people under the law. But even that isn't what it's talking about. It's they're not doing the practical application of faith. So it's uh, so when it talks about faith without works is dead, it's talking about not works of the law, but works of faith. And James 2, 24 says, you see then how that by, by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Uh, a clear contradiction between that and Romans 3, 28. But Romans 3, 28, we're justified by faith alone. We see that we receive the atonement right now. And uh, Israel doesn't receive the atonement until Jesus' second coming. So they have to have works of faith. And it gives an example of, of Abraham. He was justified by a work of faith of sacrificing Isaac upon the altar. Well, that cannot be a work of the law because the law says thou shalt not kill. 
So it was him obeying God, believing in the resurrection, knowing that he would not really be dead permanently because God would have to raise him from the dead even if he did physically kill him. Then you're given the example after that of Rahab being justified by works in addition to faith when she sent the when she sent the spies out and uh, you know the government officials they had him go you know not go chase them out to try to chase down the spies when she was really hiding the spies in her house. So uh, again, that's not a work of the law because the law says thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. So she's bearing false witness against her neighbor, which is the government officials. She intentionally lies to the government officials, but she blesses Israel by keeping them safe. And so the, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12, I will bless those who bless you. And in thee, in Israel, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so, uh, you see, Rahab is having a work of faith by lying, by disobeying a, a commandment of the Mosaic Law. So, uh, James is showing that faith, uh, the salvation, justification for Israel, is faith plus works of faith. And the work of faith for them, specifically, is not taking the mark of the beast, not worshiping the image of the beast. We see that from Hebrews 6 that if you fall away, it's impossible to be renewed. There's an, an unpardonable sin. And in Revelation 14, 9 through 11, the unpardonable sin is identified as taking the mark or worshiping the image of the beast. It says, if you take the mark and you worship the image of the beast, you will have your place in an eternal lake of fire. That's Revelation 14, 9 through 11. Therefore, we understand that from Revelation 14, 9 through 11, that the... Uh, the unpardonable sin of Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 is taking the mark or worshiping the image of the beast. And then the work of faith in James chapter 2, whereby they endure unto the end and keep their salvation, is by not taking the mark, not worshiping the image of the beast. So that's the book of James. Then you get to 1 and 2 Peter. 1 and 2 Peter are uh, written a little later than um, the rest of the rest of uh, the Hebrew epistles, I believe. I believe Hebrews and James and Revelation, uh, at least those, were written before Acts 7. But uh, first and second Peter, Peter calls his audience Christians. And Christians are not, the word Christian isn't used until it's used by the believers in Antioch, for the believers in Antioch in Acts chapter 11. So then you know that the dispensation of grace has already started by the time 1st and 2nd Peter are written. So 1st and 2nd Peter is the correction of bad faith doctrine with regard to the nation of Israel. 2nd uh, Peter 2 has a great warning in there. Uh, about the people who will infiltrate the little flock, especially in that last half of the tribulation period. Rich people. Well, they're rich because they've aligned themselves with the Antichrist. And they say they're serving God, but they're not really. Jesus said over in John 16, 1, or maybe John 18, 1, I'm not, can't remember. He says, there will come a time when those who kill you think they are doing God's service. And so there will be people who align themselves with the Antichrist thinking that's what the God is speaking through them, uh, through the Antichrist, but it's a false religion. Just like many people align themselves with the Catholic Church today thinking that they're uh, serving God that way, but they're not. They're in apostasy. If they read and believe God's word rightly divided, then they'll understand that the Catholicism um, system is a false religion. It's, it's mystery bab it's part of mystery Babylon. And the same thing with the Antichrist. The Antichrist religion is part of Mystery Babylon. And that's mentioned over in Revelation 17. That's basically Satan's... Uh, Mystery Babylon is Satan's religious system. And it's a mystery because you don't see it as that. The Catholic Church does not put over their door Babylon. You know, uh, the same thing with, uh, with the Antichrist and his forces. Peter mentions, uh, and I think it's in 1 Peter chapter 5, he's... A saluting the people of the church in Babylon. Well, that's talking to saints, believers that are in Jerusalem. He calls Jerusalem Babylon.
because Jerusalem isn't the holy city when the Antichrist is sitting on the throne, declared himself to be God, and is sitting in the temple and causing all to bow down to an image or all to uh, take the mark in order to uh, be safe. But really, they're uh, pledging their allegiance to, to the devil. And if you've understood scripture, then you would understand that. And that's why there's a lot of instruction for Israel during that, uh, for the tribulation period. Jesus said over in Matthew 24 that there will be many false Christs that arise that will deceive many. There will be many false prophets. Uh, it says that the, the deception program of Satan gets so strong that if God allowed the tribulation period to go on longer than seven years, then no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, that time is, is shortened. And so you have, uh, so you have uh, first and second Peter then is the correction of bad faith doctrine when it comes for Israel. And so you've got warnings uh, in 2 Peter 2 of these rich people who come in, who are uh, eating among them. They act like they're, they're believers just like them, but they're really going to try to get the ones who are the leaders and get them to be killed. And so the warning is don't let them feast with you. They're, they're just the most awful people in the world. They're not, not even considered people according to 2 Peter 2. They're considered to be brute beasts, natural brute beasts made to be made to be taken um, and destroyed. And really that's why God, you look at what happens in the world, there's been approximately 100 billion people who have lived over history and uh, maybe more. And, you know, a good 99 billion plus are going to be in hell. It's going to be a small minority of people who believe the gospel and are in God's eternal kingdom, both in heaven and on earth, together. It's going to be a small minority. So you're going to have easily 99 billion people in hell. So how does God deal with that? Well, he's long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that it should, all should come to repentance, according to 1 Peter 5. But... Um, God looks at those people not as real people. He says they're natural brute beasts. They're, they've, not, they've chosen because what a brute beast does is it just follows its instinct. So they didn't use their free will to make a conscious decision to trust in uh, God, believe the gospel, and be saved. They just followed their instinct. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And so he says those people aren't really people. They're just like beasts. So he doesn't mind destroying them. I mean, he loves them and wants them to be saved, but he recognizes them for who they are on the inside. Uh, Jesus said that the ones uh, the Pharisees were full of dead men's bones and all excess. They're whited sepulchers. They're dead inside. So God doesn't see them as real people. So first and second Peter is correcting the, the doctrine of faith with regard to uh, Israel's program. And then 1 John is given the doctrine of charity for Israel. Um, God's love is mentioned more in the book of 1 John than I think any of the other books of your Bible. And 1 John is only five chapters long. So it talks about the love of God a lot. And it is a, um, it's as it progresses in that doctrine there, just like Ephesians is the charity doctrine for us, and it talks about life in heavenly places. First John is talking about life for Israel when they're saved in the kingdom program on earth. So that's why First John 3, I think it's verse 8, says that someone who is born of God cannot sin. It is impossible for someone born of God to sin. Well, Israel is born again, they're born of God at Jesus' second coming. So it's looking forward to that time when the old covenant is taken away, they're given uh, the gift of eternal life for believing God, having faith plus works of faith, and then they, um, uh, the new covenant is written, the law is written on their inward parts, and they're given the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit causes them to obey God perfectly. So then they don't sin. So when they are born of God, they cannot sin, ever. 1 John 3, 8 says that. So you know that's not for today because even the best Christians among us sin today. Every day. We sin every day. So um, 1 John is about charity, the doctrine of love and charity, uh, God's love. Uh, and they can have it while they're in going through tribulation period. Jesus said in John 13, 35 to his disciples, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. So they can... Uh, 
reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel with the gospel of the kingdom to repent and be water baptized by sharing God's love. So it is an encouragement in 1 John to share God's love during that tribulation period so that the lost sheep of the house of Israel may be saved. But it's also looking forward to the future time uh, in God's kingdom on earth when they will never sin because they will be born of God and God's love will come through them. Uh, just like what we've got in the book of Ephesians. It talks about heavenly places, that we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places right now. So we can have God's love come through us right now, but practically speaking, we're still gonna sin because we still have our sin nature, just like Israel does until the second coming. And then they were born of God, so they have that divine nature. They have Christ living in them. And uh, I think of all the New Testament books, because we're not in that dispensation, we're in the dispensation of grace, we're not in Israel's program, of all the New Testament books, 1 John is the hardest to understand. Um, it, it seems like if they don't live perfectly with God's love coming through them perfectly, that they're never really saved. And uh, of course, that's not the case. It's really talking about that future time, God's kingdom on earth. Um, but it's probably the hardest New Testament book for us to understand. Peter, at the end of 2 Peter, and that's why we know it's written later, is in 2 Peter 3.15, he talks about the some of the epistles that Paul has written, and he talks about how they are scripture. So they're already considered scripture. The Bible was not put together and a canon officially established by some council of Nicaea in uh, 350 AD or whenever they say it is. The canon of scripture was identified by prophets that God gave. Uh, in Ephesians 4 it says the Lord Jesus Christ gave prophets among other gifts uh, to the body of Christ and the prophets then were in charge of determining what is God's scripture and what isn't. And uh, Paul's epistles are the last books of your Bible that are written. And so they, so the prophets continue until they say, this is God's scripture, it's completed, the canon is done, God's, God's about it toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Uh, there are no more scriptures to be written after this. And so uh, they identify the canon, the 66 books of the Bible that we have today as scripture, while other books like the epistle that Paul wrote to the Laodiceans is not in that scripture, not considered because the prophet says it's not holy scripture. And so that is something that um, the prophets established, not the Council of Nicaea 300 years later. Uh, and so, um, so first John, the doctrine of charity, Second and Third John are the two shortest books in your entire Bible, and um, they are written. I believe it's to Israel. It's believing Israel and its instructions to them in the millennial reign. So what happens is at the end of the tribulation period, then the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, and he destroys the Antichrist and his forces and he resurrects all of believing Israel. And believing Israel goes into Israel, into that nation, to the land. Uh, Jesus Christ builds the temple. He sets that in Jerusalem. He sits on the throne along with King David. And the two of them are co-regents in God's kingdom on earth in Jerusalem. And then Israel, believing Israel then, is a kingdom of priests. And the purpose of the millennial reign is that they go out during the thousand years and they share the Mosaic law with the Gentiles because the law is our schoolmaster to bring us under Christ that we might be justified by faith. So they get that Mosaic law and then they share it to, um, to Gentiles and so that they may be taught to uh, trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. And at the end of the, millenn the millennial reign, Satan is loosed for a short time. And that's where they get the opportunity. So Jesus Christ rules in the millennial reign with a rod of iron. And um, under that Mosaic law, strict obedience. So you're going you're gonna to obey it because you're forced to. But then once the millennial reign is over, they can choose to side with Jesus, trust in him to save them. Or they can trust in a usurper, Satan, and say that he will save them. And so based on what side they choose determines their destiny, where they will live forever. 
but uh, they get that thousand year millennial reign so that the Gentiles may be reached with the gospel. Again, the Gentiles have been reached for the last 2,000 years, but God is merciful and he is trying to save. He wants everybody to be saved. So he gives man time, chance after chance after chance, plenty of opportunities to believe and be saved. Uh, and so uh, second and third John is instructions to believe in Israel in the millennial reign. Uh, the book of Jude is very similar to, it's only one chapter, uh, longer than 2nd and 3rd John though, and it's very similar to 2nd Peter chapter 2, talking about those brute beasts, those evil people who infiltrate themselves among the little flock. So that would be especially during that last half of the tribulation period, just like 2nd Peter 2. I think he got an extra, um, a repeat of that, and it's in a separate book just because that is so important to understand. Not to be deceived by the Antichrist and those following him in the name of God, but to uh, recognize that that is a false religion and to trust God and his word instead. And then finally, you got the book of Revelation. Revelation is the hope doctrine for uh, believing Israel. And uh, of course, it's all about the end times for them. It has the judgments of God against uh, the world. You've got uh, seven seal judgments, which encompass this whole seven years of the tribulation period. The uh, seventh seal, when that's open, then you've got the seven trumpet judgments in there. And then there are seven vile judgments that are encompassed among the seven trumpet, uh, the seventh trumpet. And the seven trumpet judgments and the seven vile judgments uh, all take place during the uh, last half or the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. The first half of the tribulation period is called the beginning of sorrows. And there are, there's a quarter of the world's population killed during that time. But the last half of the tribulation is called the great tribulation. And it's called that because then basically you got to choose. If you choose to bow down to the image of the beast, then you can live on the earth and you're, but you're pledging your eternal allegiance to the devil. So if you bow down or you take the mark of the beast, then uh, you will have uh, eternal damnation in the lake of fire. So that's why it's the great tribulation because you've got to choose which you're going to choose. You're either going to choose to have life on this earth or you're going to choose to have life with God. So that's why it's called the great tribulation. So the mark of the beast and the uh, image of the beast that starts the last half of the tribulation period, or the last three and a half years. And then God brings out his greatest judgments of the seven trumpet judgments and the seven vile judgments during those last three and a half years. But he, um, but he reserves, it, so he has that, and a lot of those um, judgments are very similar to the plagues, the 10 plagues in the book of Exodus. And so then once the tribulation period is over, then there's going to be darkness upon the earth. And I believe there is from the end, the last chapter in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, it appears that there is uh, 45 days between the end of the tribulation period and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so I would say there's probably about 40 days where the world sits in darkness, or at least 30. Uh, and so all the lights are turned out, the stars the s s fall from the sky, the sun grows dark, the moon turned into blood, and uh, you don't have any artificial light because the great city Babylon's been completely destroyed with an earthquake. Uh, and so then you've got the, the Battle of Armageddon there. Well, that's not yet. So anyway, they sit in darkness for, there's a 45 day period there. And it basically gives man the chance to think of what's gone on. And to make sure that they understand, you know, who, you know, make sure they're on God's side and not Satan's side. And then when the 45 days are over, Jesus comes back as a thief in the night. And uh, his bright light comes and he comes to make war. He comes with the sword coming out of his mouth. That all those who have uh, taken the mark or worship the image of the beast follow Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And they go into... Uh, the Valley of Armageddon, which is just below Jerusalem, and they uh, fight against Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ instantly destroys all of them with the sword that comes out of his mouth, so it's not a contest at all, even though Jesus Christ is vastly outnumbered in numbers, but he has the power because he has the Word of God. The sword proceeding out of, his, out of his mouth is the Word of God, 
it's that same uh, word that he used to create everything in Genesis chapter 1. So it's the same word that he uses to destroy all those aligned with Satan. So he does that, and then um, he resurrects the believing Israel, and then that's where Psalm 23 can, comes in. He leads them through the valley of the shadow of death. He makes them to lie down in green pastures. He leads them beside the still waters. He gives them all these things uh, for being, um, you know, believing Israel. And they have to go through that valley of the shadow of death, the valley of Armageddon, where all these people have been destroyed and the birds have come and eaten their flesh. But they don't fear any evil because Jesus is with them. Their rod, his rod and his staff comfort them. And then they go into Jerusalem there and the marriage supper of the lambs takes place. The Lord Jesus Christ marries uh, believing Israel and becomes his bride and they're one with the Lord and they're in the Father's house there uh, in, in Jerusalem uh, forever. And so then he sends them out then for the thousand year millennial reign to go to reach the Gentiles as a kingdom of priests, giving them the Mosaic law so they may also learn to fear the Lord. And then uh, once the millennial reign is over, uh, then there is, and these things are mentioned in those last few chapters in Revelation. Revelation 19 is where Jesus comes back. Revelation 20 mentions the millennial reign. It's the only chapter in the Bible that mentions the thousand year reign. You wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for Revelation 20. It mentions then that uh, after the millennial reign that Satan is loosed for a little season and he goes out and he deceives the nations and the majority of the people even though they've been under Jesus rod of iron rule for a thousand years they fail to see his love they are selfish and they want to do their own thing and so that's when they end up um, most of the people they have their choice are they going to side with God and trust in uh, Jesus to save them or are they going to side with Satan and the vast majority of the people side with Satan and so then he gathers them together the the armies are called Gog and Magog and I think that's just a general label for all those nations and so um, Satan is able to gather all these nations together and they uh, fight uh, against Jesus and just like at Armageddon um, they soundly defeat um, Jesus soundly defeats Satan and his forces. It's not even close. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. He was in a bottomless pit for the thousand years, uh, the thousand year millennial reign. Satan is cast into a lake of fire. And then all unbelievers are then uh, resurrected and they are judged. Because you've had at least the last 6,000 years unbelievers, they're all dead in the ground. So they got to be resurrected. So they're resurrected. And there is the great white throne judgment. And so they are judged since they didn't believe the gospel. They're not judged by the faith of Christ. They don't receive justification. But they are judged based upon their works. And they found, and in their works, they found they, they have to have patient continuance and well-doing according to Romans 2.7. Which basically means they have to live a perfect life. Never sin. And since none of them do, then all of them are cast into a lake of fire to burn forever. And then the dispensation of the fullness of times begins. And you'll have uh, the increase, Isaiah 9 says, the increase of Jesus Christ's government on earth will be without end. And so we don't have a lot of details of what happens, but we just know that we are experiencing God's love. We are given an out. We never sin. There is no death, sorrow, crying, pain, or anything. Uh, we, as the body of Christ, are in heaven. Israel, believing Israel is on earth, the last few verses in John chapter 1 mentions that the, the angels ascend and descend upon the Son of Man. And so angels, according to Hebrews 1.14, are ministering spirits for those who would be heirs of salvation. And so the angels then are, um, we send them out. And when heaven, we send out the angels to do whatever they need to, needs to be done. And then angels come down to earth and they, Israel sends them out to do whatever needs to be done. And there are children that are born. Uh, the population continues to grow, and uh, there, you know, and that's just how it goes forever. But we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in heavenly places in those positions of authority, thrones, principalities, powers, mights, dominions, every name that is named. And Israel will rule in their positions of authority on the earth. And so God's kingdom on earth will be just as glorious as God's kingdom in heaven. No one will feel slighted. But we all serve in the way we live perfect lives and share God's love. 
is through uh, Jesus Christ in us. Uh, Jesus Christ coming, living in us. And, uh, and so it's really, and I started by talking about how in Genesis 1, God gave dominion of, the, of everything that he made over to Adam. Adam gave that up to Satan, and then in the dispensation of the fullness of times, everything is back under man, one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all who are in Christ then, as his body or as his bride, body in heaven, bride on earth, then uh, we share God's love and bring glory to God and glory to ourselves indirectly, and uh, we and so God and so God's entire kingdom, both heaven and earth, are filled with love. And he couldn't have done that at first without making Adam a mind-numb robot. But then, if he did that, it wouldn't be love. So he had to give man free will, and it takes at least. 7,000 years before we get to the point where everything is reconciled back to God, both heaven and earth. And uh, now it's nothing but glory and God's love in both realms through a creation, human beings, who have made the free will decision to believe God and to have Christ's blood atone for their sins so that now we live in Christ. So God brings the glory to man, but that man is his son, Jesus Christ, and then us in him. And that's the conclusion of our Bible summary. Thanks for watching.